This is ADT 1160U, Digital Communication Technologies. The title of this video clip is Civic and Political Mobilization. Digital communication technologies, aka social media, are potentially powerful tools for civic and political mobilization. In order to know more about this, we interviewed Fahim Moussi, digital media developer at Concordia University TV in Montreal. CUTV is a non-profit organization owned by Concordia Student Broadcasting Corporation. It is a community TV and video production studio that provides facilities, equipment, and training to people who want to learn how to do video production. You can learn more about CUTV on their website. The analysis questions for this video clip are as follows. Can you describe what the role of CUTV is? How does CUTV manage and level social media outlets to communicate with supporters on the web? Can you provide your perspective on the power of social media for civic and political mobilization? During Printemps Érable, the famous Quebec student strike in 2012, CUTV played a very important role to inform the population on what was really going on. Was that problematic for CUTV? What is the mission of CUTV, if you had to say? Is it, is it a social activism mission? Is it a social activism support mission? Our, act, our activism, like us as staff, our activism is to provide knowledge and power to members who can't uh, easily, readily access it in the community. So for $20 a year, a member who is not a, a non-undergraduate student member who doesn't pay tuition fees can access a curriculum and equipment that is vastly, vastly beyond their, their own budget, so oftentimes. And uh, we're, we're there to support that learning endeavor and to, uh, uh, to facilitate any of the productions that members are trying to engage in. So that is our number one mandate. Okay. And secondly, is to make sure that the content that we produce isn't just trying to replicate exactly what we're seeing in mainstream media, because we want to give, if, if content are the eyeballs on our culture and our, our, our society we want to give as much uh, variety in that uh, in that view that we all have when we're looking back in the future so yeah so if you're for example a member of the community and you're you just want to become a member of CUTV you pay your fees and you can have access to the equipment and start reporting and you get yes I mean you can't just walk in and start reporting although that is what was happening during the student strikes we had people who had never been part of the organization before step out onto the street with a microphone and obviously there's uh, there's difficulties in that um, uh, due to lack of training and we're, the fact that we're on, on, on air but we weren't on CRTC airwaves so right. we weren't really subject to any uh, kind of uh, um, legal implications. And that would explain why some of the reporters got into more trouble than they should because you know a trained reporter wouldn't know when to stop yes. or should know when to stop. I appreciate hearing that because like, it was something that was refu people refused to acknowledge for, for a time at CUTV and it wasn't until the reputation started becoming a reality to some of the other producers that, uh, that people started right. saying okay we don't want to do what we did then we want to we want to keep doing what we're doing mean being there and having the camera there and and, and giving our view but uh, it, there's a difference between journalism uh, and reporting facts and telling a story and expressing personal opinions and feelings right. and and as for a long time I tried to insist guys can you please instead of calling it uh, news reporting from the ground can you just say community coverage like it'll make I, I feel it'll make a big difference because here you're explaining to the public that um, in exchange for being able to have your eyeballs on the ground without being there you just have to listen to one of our community members talking expressing their personal opinions and stuff like that right. and I feel like maybe we would have avoided all that scrutiny about uh, not performing authentic journalism which I agree with oftentimes we were not uh, performing authentic journalism right. but at the same time there was also a lot and the Overall, the most important thing that I feel that came out of that was just those images getting on people's screens. Like that was essential, and also just to be able to witness how long these students, the numbers of people that are out there, and to remind people that maybe you're not seeing it every day on the news or or seeing a lot of it on the news, but there's a lot of it happening right outside your door. Like, right. Yeah. Right. And that was the channel through which I watched the students strike right? because obviously I went out in the street. I looked at what was happening. Obviously, I was not walking in the walkout, in in the in the uh, the, the uh, manifestations, but I was walking next to it, showing my support in some way. 
uh, and just trying to see, you know, what I hear on the news, is it really real or what's going on exactly? And obviously, I, you know, I, just being in close, you were in danger. Oh, absolutely. So, so yeah. <laughs> watching through CUTV was a, a good way to do it. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's quite a complex mandate and it's it's quite innovative. I've never, I personally have never heard about, you know, such a, an innovative approach. Um, obviously, that wouldn't be possible without social media at this point, without you know the nature of the web. So, can you talk a little bit about um, how CTV manages and leverages these social media outlets to uh, to communicate with their supporters on the web? In terms of supporters of uh, of uh, the news programming's uh, point of view or something like that, um, one example I can give is uh, we used YouTube um, back in two thousand. Uh, 2000, the fall of 2011, um, to create this video, this online campaign, uh, like uh, in protest of, of uh, Charest called Dear Charest. So me and, and two other staff members uh, were uh, basically uh, um, producing these. <laughs> we produced uh, the the two staff members edited and filmed a hundred uh, over a hundred videos. 100 vox pops, meaning like people on the street just uh, being asked a question and responding to the camera. And we were editing them out and sending them out that day and sending uh, uh, mass emails to like, um, uh, and, and encourage people to send them mass emails to these political offices uh, with links to these videos. And in these videos were the community actually just saying, in, in with short 30 second segments, saying uh, a question uh, or answering a question or expressing a sentiment. And it actually got quite a bit of traction and, and got one of those uh, most viewed things on YouTube for that month or something. Um, but uh, it was the first time where we uh, had a campaign online to try and achieve something. Because it's very different to have just a campaign with a goal that you're trying to achieve. Or raise right? the awareness. Or, exactly. Yeah. There, there's a specific goal which you can develop uh, tools to try and measure uh, versus just general distribution of our content. So that's that brings me back to my first point that with regards to the tech, uh, like just the technical distribution aspect. We uh, like uh, we leverage social media tools to have our content appear in as many places as possible. Um, but um, I'm, I wasn't sure if your question was more asking, well, how did these tools uh, get used for political mobilization? Right. Uh, and I, I, I feel like that's more idea. what you're concerned with. Yeah. Um, so, um, honestly, uh, there was not uh, very much um, uh, strategizing to achieve a goal after that uh, Dear Charest uh, campaign. It was much more, much more focus was placed on um, uh, taking advantage of the live broadcasting to engage audiences online. So at one point we had a broadcast, and this is when we had two live backpacks. So we had a live backpack in Ottawa, we had a live, uh, sorry, uh, Quebec City, a live backpack here in Montreal during, pro during a simultaneous protest, and we had an in-studio host who had guests coming in. And at the same time, uh, at certain areas, because these were long broadcasts, that host would start receiving Skype call-ins from people that were solicited on, on Twitter or uh, on Facebook, and we're having people from all over the world engaging in the studio, uh, and a studio, I mean, uh, the size of this room, and uh, when I say studio, I'm using that word very liberally. Uh, it was very, very not much, not at all a studio, more a desk and a background, rather. Um, and uh, we were engaging people uh, in that manner over the web, and I think that that specifically was the uh, that and the Dear Charest campaign were evidences of when we actually tried to use these social media and online co uh, communication tools to engage our audience and and mobilize uh, discussion, you know, rather than mobilize um, like a specific act. And so yeah. Um, other than that, uh, like the likes, uh, all those Facebook likes and stuff like that, they came from the standard, um, just you know, having the the buttons, and the calls to action uh, appearing on our website and in uh, in tweets and stuff like that. But mostly, it came from people just uh, watching the feeds and starting to share online. Like we got a good nine thousand likes purely from the people that were watching the, the protests. Right. And, uh, and the same, same goes with the donations. Uh, it was from, from uh, the t uh, title text call-outs that were coming out on there. Uh, at one point, we were, we were using social, uh, Twitter, for example, to also help facilitate um, one of the uh, uh, 
uh, production processes in order to be able to work, uh, to garner our audience, and that's first of all to let people know when the broadcast is happening. At that time, there was there was not enough time uh, during that. Uh, during those days, there wasn't enough time to uh, develop um, the, the website to automatically notify people that this broadcast was going to be available in 10 minutes. You know, right. I could do it, but it might take me a few days, and we didn't have a few days back then. So uh, uh, rather, rather than relying on the website, we said, okay, we'll create a Twitter account that simply that only represents when a broadcast is on and when a broadcast is ended and when a video is available to be watched and shared. Okay. So that was part of the post production and distribution process. Uh, when the video once the uh, once the broadcast went live, uh, or just before the broadcast was live, that Twitter account would tweet that. It would never tweet anything editorial or personal or conversational. So you were informing people of availability of exactly. broadcasts, and Gee. you were getting from the discussions of the reactions through, for example, the Facebook uh, the Facebook live. Exactly. Exactly. And um, and for I found Twitter to be actually a more uh, effective way of people get receiving notifications than even the something provided that we could have provided on the website simply because you can have um, cell phone uh, text messages sent to your Twitter uh, from your Twitter account. Right. Uh, so looking back at the whole experience, if you had a bit more uh, time to plan, you would have probably prepared the reporters differently. Uh, leverage the organization, the social media usage, so that some someone could keep keep track of it Absolutely. more efficiently. Yeah. And uh, in the end, um, if, if this was to come back again, this event, and probably it never will, mm -hmm. but if you know something like that was to occur again, what would be the first thing you would do? Oh, definitely the deer share right thing again. Like that thing was was fantastic. It was really easy, and it's impressive when people see like fifty videos uh, of all actually varying uh, messages, but from people, like, right. from people that are clearly not part of the organization that's giving you the content, um, and and uh, saying saying things that like basically taking a stand and not being afraid to have their image recorded and distributed to the entire World Wide Web, and uh, and if you're if we're talking about social media. Mm -hmm. I, those videos were very social, you know, like uh, as, as, a, as a media object compared right. to uh, even a Twitter uh, tweet, you know, like which is a message rather than a, than than a. I see it more as a, a communication tool rather than a medium to digest content. Uh, although that definitely happens on there, so it's more of a notification platform and an information uh, providing a tool than uh, than actually. Um, uh, Having something that you're going to uh, yeah, just digest, engage in, you know, like uh, Indeed. yeah. Well, that was quite the run around CTV. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, like, <laughs> I, okay. I wish I could be more precise and like uh, and, and, and. Well, obviously you're like describing a, you know a dynamic organization and a messy way of working, but at yeah. the same time a very efficient way of working because yeah. it gets the message across. Absolutely. So, folks, that was Fahim Musi and Anne Louise Davidson. Years. By the way, please, everyone can live broadcast. It's really not difficult. Just search some videos on the web, send me an email at fahim.musi.gmail.com and I'll help you with it in any way possible. The important thing is that everyone understands they can take part in media, they can produce media, and this is the new generation. This is how we're going to survive. Good enough is the new date. The synthesis questions for this video clip are as follows. What is the mission of CUTV? Do you think CUTV gives a credible message? And what is the takeaway of the interview with Fahim Moussi?